Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Behind Fine Wine. I am extremely pleased to welcome my friend Stuart Risto from Riedel, Canada. Thanks for coming, Stuart. Thanks for having me in. My pleasure, my pleasure. And I'm also extremely happy to say that we are going to be drinking the wine today out of this amazing piece of art that Riedel recently uh, came out with. This is one, this is an Elton John I am, is that how you pronounce I it? I am, yes. I am decanter. Um, I saw this, I was uh, in a cafe in South America and Maximilian Riedel posted that they had come out with this uh, and Elton John has always been my absolute favorite and I instantly went, oh my God, how do I get one of those? And Stuart came to my rescue and he said, there's only two coming into Canada and we've got one for you. So uh, this is the first time that we've ever used it. And we're going to be drinking a 1970 Codestrinel from that. And why 1970, you may ask? Because uh, my favorite Elton John album, Elton John being my favorite artist, uh, my favorite Elton John album is 1170, uh, sorry, 171170. Uh, and so I thought this would be a good one to have in kind of a comedians in cars getting coffee kind of way. So, loving the concept. So we're gonna have this, and so sure. I'm gonna pour Easiest this. Way to pour. Is it like that? Okay. Yeah, well, why don't you do the honors sure. because we'll you know the because I mean, you're the you're expert. Like this. If you listen to the decanter, you're gonna hear it cluck a little as it forces air through. Oh yeah, listen to that. Amazing. God, that's gonna set it down. It has to reload. Now, we only poured this a couple of minutes ago. We're going to talk a little bit about the canting here this afternoon, but, um, but, the, uh, but we only poured this a couple of minutes ago because it's such an old wine. I don't like to pour them uh, too early. Um, this one is certainly in the latter years of its life. I wouldn't give it a lot more, a lot more years, but it was one that I really wanted to try. So, I'm so, happy to try it with you. Yeah, so cheers. Cheers. Thank you. We're drinking this out of obviously a Riedel Bordeaux. Would it be just a Riedel Bordeaux glass or is there it's a name the for it? It's the Riedel Veritas Bordeaux glass. The Riedel Veritas Bordeaux. Cheers. And you know what? That's changed a bit even since, since the initial we just, sample. Yeah. <coughs> when we, when we wow, tasted it. We still enough tannin there. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah. When we started, uh, just before to make sure that the wine Some was still stuff. good. Uh, it, it was giving off a little bit of funk. Um, uh, you got a little bit of matterization yeah. on it. Uh, it's blown off, dusty down. and kind of off, all blown off. And uh, that's thanks to us drinking it out of this, again, amazing piece of art. So I am, okay. I cannot tell you how happy I am to have this. This is going to be one of my most prized possessions. So I'm just, gonna- Just a little bit about that piece. Uh, it's yeah, the please. I Am Decanter. We have a series of I Am Decanters and the I Am name comes from the world's most expensive chicken from Indonesia. Because this chicken. This decanter was done for the year of the rooster. Oh, I didn't know that, okay. So if you look at it, you have the beak we just poured out of, you have the large body and the tail where I was holding it. Okay. So it's a chicken shape. Uh, I am is an Indonesian chicken, it is all black. Black skin, black beak, black meat, black blood. Really? And they retail about $2,500 or $3,000 per bird. Holy cow. But so that's why Maximilian was looking for a name for our year of the rooster decanter. So what's the most expensive chicken to his Assistant, and she said, well, it's the I am. He said, it's a good name, let's use it. Right, that's, that's a great we, story. I didn't know that. Name. And that, so now this particular decanter, I've mentioned that it's one of only 75 in the world. This mm -hmm. is to raise money for the Elton John AIDS Foundation. Yes, right? uh, we, did, we did a decanter last year with the Elton John AIDS Foundation, and it was our double magnum Amadeo, which we put a rainbow onto uh, for the foundation. We did 50 of those. They sold out in an instant. We did 75 of these, only because 50 is our normal run for limited edition piece. Yep. We did 75 because it's the 25th anniversary of Elton John's AIDS Foundation this okay. year. It's also the reason we added the silver stripe onto the, the rainbow that's on the back. Gotcha. And it's all listed on that uh, certificate of authenticity you have with this. Yeah, event. I put it away, but it's a, it's a beautiful certificate. And by the way, behind us, this is another one of mine that I've always had out, uh, this being the uh, Eve. Yes. And what do you call the other one? Oh, this is the Swan. The Swan. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of decanting. Um, everything, whites, reds, everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, if nothing else, just for, um, I don't want to say the ceremony of it, but the, it really always adds something to an evening. If I'm pour, like, I mean, think of pouring out of this bottle, which is an interesting great bottle anyway, but the minute that you add an element like this or like this or like this, it now becomes special. Absolutely, and that's one of the three reasons we all tell people that we decant. If you ask Maximilian Riedel or George Riedel, his father, who are the, 
uh, owner and president of the company at this point in time, respectively. They will tell you that there's three reasons to can't. With an older bottle of wine like this, obviously we can see the sediment on the sides of this bottle. So we're looking to separate the sediment from the wine. With a young bottle of wine, we're obviously going to want to uh, help to age the wine out and yep. um, reduce the tannins a touch by decanting it. And the third reason is what you just said, it looks cool. Yeah. When you bring wine to the table in a decanter and people don't see the label, they're automatically assuming it's a higher quality wine than you may or may not be serving. Sure. There's no preconceived notion of what you're getting. So quality comes at all price points. So I could put a blue nun in the eve. <laughs> you could, I would, if you were going to clean it possibly. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. I get a lot, nun, of, baby a lot of stickiness in it. Um, uh, you know, in fact, it does look cool until I tried doing this for the first time. And then when I couldn't get any wine out, yeah. it doesn't look as cool. Yeah. So there's an instructional DVD that comes with pouring this one. But once you get good at it, then it looks cool. Yeah, there's a true ceremony to using the Eve. And uh, it's the one that we use at all of our tastings because it will help us to quiet down somebody in the audience who may or may not think they know yeah. too much. Yeah. So, uh, George and Maximilian Riedel, um, let's go to the, to the name uh, Riedel. Uh, a percentage of time, uh, people say Riedel as opposed to Riedel. And do you correct them or do we, you just bring it up in conversation? We absolutely do correct them. It's, okay. it's Riedel, the way to remember, Riedel like needle if you are looking to speak about the brand. If your name is Sandy or Danny, you can call it Riedel. That's the high school in the Greece movies. Really? But that's the only people that are allowed to. Okay. Sandy and Danny, the leads in the Grease film, so we figured what the <laughs> hell, we'd let them do it. Other than that, no, it's Riedel like Needle. Okay. Uh, Maximilian is the 11th generation. He is the current CEO and president of the company. Uh, George, the 10th generation, is his dad. He is the owner of the business. And Maximilian's grandfather, Klaus, is the one who started the varietal specific glassware phase, trend, Okay. as it may be. Yeah, and when when would that trend have happened? Like, because what were what were people uh, what were people doing up until then, and when did that happen? And we're going to talk about this a little bit because the reason the the the, the main or I think one of the first times that you and I met was at a uh, stemware tasting that was showing the difference in specific stemware. Which, if you get a chance to do it, and we're going to tell you at the end of this how to do that is so worth the effort. I found it completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. But so when would that have started a varietal specific tasting? The first or tasting the first, I mean, uh, glassware. Uh, Klaus Joseph Riedel, we call the father of varietal specific glassware, came up with the concept 44 years ago now. So it hasn't been that long. The Riedel family's been in business making glass of one variety or another, crystal of one style or another, whether it be window panes, sites for um, weaponry, you know, um, glassware, okay. anything, anything you can imagine, plates, servingware, all of these things. They've done these over the years since 1756. Wow. So we're 260, what's that, 263 years now? So, and stemware was only in the last how long? Well, stemware they've been making for the last 100 plus years. Okay. But up until 43 years ago, it was all cut crystal. Okay. It was all about having the function, or the function secondary to the form. Okay. Where we've now reversed that, taking the Bajos principle into effect. Okay. And putting function first, followed by form. Okay. So his goal at that point in time was he was drinking really high quality Bordeaux and Burgundy and enjoying the wines, but he was finding they were different every time he tried them, and he complained about how the wine, there must be you know, these inconsistencies in the winemaking, it was crazy how these winemakers couldn't make their wine consistent all the time, until the winemaker told him, no, actually our wine is perfectly consistent, here, try these six bottles, pick them at random, pull the corks and try. And he took a bottle home after he tried them there, and they were all the same, he got home, it was different. Went to his neighbor's house, it was different. Tried to figure out what caused the differences, the only thing that changed was the glassware. So we started to experiment. And his goal was to create the perfect glass to drink Grand Cru Burgundy. Oh, okay. And the first glass that was created is now, well, the, the model of it is now on display, on permanent display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Really? Wow. So a Grand Cru that's Burgundy glass. Very cool. So that's the first of these that was done, and that was done, yeah, 44 years ago to, at, at this point in time. And so there's a, uh, the thing that I learned, and I didn't know it embarrassingly at the time, because that was maybe only 10 years ago. Uh, the, the how big the difference is in drinking out of particular glasses. And I did it at a Taz Winery here in, in Niagara was the first tasting that I did. And I think Maury Taz, who owns that winery, had said the minute that he did it, he stopped doing those sample servings at the wine retailer store because his wine he realized now will not be showing in that. So we'd rather just not do that at all. Then and so it really, really taught me the difference in that. Do you, so do you find, um, I mean, I, I've got way too much stemware as a ratio to my, uh, the, my amount of available cupboard space. There's no such thing as too much. Well, that's what I keep telling my wife. We just need more cupboards. 
Um, but do you find that there is an initial pushback to saying, oh, you guys and your, I mean, come on. Absolutely. Yeah. So, how, so what do you do with that? Do you just show it to them? Do you it is the, the first question I ask everybody when we do a tasting, as I did at the, uh, the toss tasting we were at. And honestly, if you head to Toss Winery now and taste at their tasting bar, they taste out of varietal specific glasses for their wines because they want it to taste at its best. Okay. And I ask people when we sit down to a tasting, who thinks that this is nothing but marketing? Is this just BS? Yeah. And invariably, there's a few people in the room whose hand will come up, and they're the ones I'll go back to at the end of the tasting to follow up and say, do you still believe that? Okay. Is it still the same situation today? Um, the factors of a glass that matter, we have three glasses here. This is our so red. So this is from the, from the Riedel Veritas? Yes. Okay. This is our Veritas red wine tasting set, and this is one of the sets we use for our tastings. We have the Cabernet, or the Bordeaux glass that we're drinking from right now. Yep. We have our New World Pinot Noir glass, and we have our Syrah glass, our Hermitage glass. And okay. really, these are the three glasses that you would need to enjoy almost all red wines. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because it was one of the questions that I'd written down. Like, if I only had uh, three glasses to choose from, would it be those? For reds, these would be the three that I would put into the list. And if you said that I wanted three just in general, I mean, your, your shards are, you know, wide bottom base followed by a, a you know, more narrow opening top. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if I were to pick three, uh, which would it be? It, would it's you gonna kind of pick? It's going to depend on the what wine drink, that you drink the most sure. and what you're, what you're looking to do. If you don't drink oak Chardonnay, you don't need a Montrachet glass. Okay. If you don't drink Bordeaux, well, I don't know, yeah. um, you don't need the glass that we're enjoying today. Okay. But it's, it's about the, the varietals. If you're drinking Italian varietals, you're going to drink out of the Syrah glass. This is your most versatile of these three red wine glasses as far as the okay. number of different wines that go into it. Now, is the app going to tell me that? Yes. Okay. You, uh, if you go to the app store, search for the Riedel Wine Glass Guide. Very coyly named. I've used that a lot. It's, I've really uh, used that app a lot. I use it all the time myself. Because yeah. I'll walk into the liquor store and I want to buy a bottle of wine and I'm not sure what glass it should be in or whether I own the glass and I work for the company. So I will go to the app and I will find it. And if I need to, I, I know a guy so I can get some glassware to yeah, enjoy yeah. the wine the right way. When I shop for wine, because I kind of prescribe to your you know, philosophy of cellaring stuff, I go and buy, I'll buy two bottles to drink today, two bottles to sell of something that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so it gives me a chance to, and that's how I started my cellar and it's grown fairly handsomely since. Great. Uh, but I always want to know what it should be drunk in. And I keep a old iPhone with the app on it in the cellar. So my wife oh, goes down because my glassware is on this side, the wine's on this side. It allows her to bring the right glasses up at the same time. Perfect. If she's grabbing wine and I'm not home because I do travel a fair bit for this job. You know, I used the app. I was buying a piece of Ramoa luggage and they had a uh, they had a, a place in it where you can bring your stemware for guys who are, you know, nice. really geek out. And you put the stem. Well, nice, except, and this is a very expensive piece mm -hmm. of luggage, except I looked at it and I went, that shape seems odd. So I, I grabbed my iPhone and I went into the Riedel app and, uh, and I start kind of flipping through it and because you've got all the dimensions of everything on it. And I'm sitting there with a the measuring tape going, this won't fit any single glass I would ever use. And I didn't buy the luggage because of it, because it didn't fit and I learned we'll it off the app. Them. I'll have to have our people talk to their people and see what's going on. Yeah, no, it's, it's not a very good piece of luggage. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so um, I was actually, before we get off the, yeah, before, the, the glasses. Yeah, before we get off the glasses, so um, carry if, on. If I had to pick three glasses and three glasses only, it's kind of like picking your favorite children for me, quite frankly, yeah. I would take an unoaked white wine glass, so my Riesling Sauvignon Blanc glass. Okay. Because I can drink Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, Gruner, Vettlinger, all of the unoaked whites. Okay. I can drink from that. It gives you a huge preponderance of the white wine population. Yeah. I would take the Bordeaux glass because wines like this are yeah. too good to pour into the wrong glass. Yeah. And because I am a huge Pinot file, I would take the Pinot Noir. And this is a glass for Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo. There are okay. literally two grapes okay. that go into that glass. Huh. But it's still one of my three. But there's people who don't like Pinot, and I would put these two and the Riesling glass. But you're right. You start off with, I mean, I, I know guys who, yeah, I don't know how you do this, but say, I don't drink white. Okay. If then, if that's the case, let's start at least with the varietals mm -hmm. that you take, or I only drink Italian or, you know, whatever. So if you, if you have that narrow band of what you drink, then you start there and, and then you move your way down. But speaking of the wine that should go in a specific glass, what's the deal with this champagne no longer in flute? Um, have you been asked about that lately? Many times. And okay, if you okay. ask Maximilian or George <laughs> Riedel, they will both tell you that the flute does nothing for the product. Okay. We are trying to improve how the wine lands on your palate, how it flows to your mouth, your enjoyment of the product at the end of the day. With a flute, you're emphasizing the acidity, 
and the effervescence in that bottle, and that's basically all you're getting. You're not getting the flavor. If you're drinking a rosé Pinot Noir, or a uh, rosé Pinot Noir, a uh, rosé Champagne, most of it's 99% Pinot Noir. That's the glass that we recommend you use for it. Look at what the product is made from, put it into that glass. Okay. We have a champagne wine glass now, which is our all-purpose uh, champagne glass. It's a wider version of a Sauvignon Blanc glass. I wish I had one here to show you. I don't, unfortunately. But it, uh, it does the job very well. It holds 14 ounces, 15 oh, okay. ounces. And so, so you would take your Chardonnay glass for most champagnes? Uh, I would take my Pinot glass for most champagnes. Really? Okay. Because yeah, most of them are based in Pinot Noir. So but Pinot Noir, but if you did a Blanc de Blanc, then a Blanc you would de Blanc, I put it into the Oak Chardonnay glass. Okay. Interesting. Absolutely. Uh, and, and sticking on the on that topic, uh, I've, I haven't seen these before, so tell me what these are uh, okay, that you brought. This is our this newest is very range. Cool. I seen this is called Performance. And the new Performance series we've literally launched this year in July. And when you look at the shape of the glass, it is almost identical. To what's going on? There's, a, there's subtle changes to it. It's a little bit deeper it's through the It's got a little bit more of a curvature and a little bit lip. more curvature at the top. These glasses are the first time that Maximilian and George have designed a set of glassware together, and all of our glassware is designed with the assistance of the winemakers. This is not a glass that Riedel went out and said, "This is a Pinot Noir glass." We do a tasting workshop where we will set glasses in front of winemakers, uh, anywhere from 15 to 45 glasses for each event. And the winemakers will go through, they will nose it, they will taste it, they will rate it. And the glass that they say serves their product the best is the glass that we say is for that product. Okay. So we did a rosé workshop last year. We've done a Pinot Noir workshop. We did a Central Otago Pinot Noir workshop. So we now have three different Pinot Noir styles. We have a New World, an Old World, and a Central Otago because Pinot, Pinot is so different everywhere it's grown. Hmm. I'm presuming someone will need a Prince Edward County Pinot glass as well. I'd be fascinated to understand, because uh, the stem wars becomes like wine almost. You, the more you dig into this rabbit hole, the more you, you, know, you just learn more and the more you realize you don't know. And I would be fascinated to understand um, the science of mechanics or maybe the art behind, because it's a central Otago Pinot, it should employ the following characteristics uh, and yeah. how they do that. The Central Otago Pinot Glass has a more diamond shape to it and a straight lip at the top as opposed to this recurve. Uh, Central Otago Pinot is a little bit more acidic, a little bit lighter on the fruit side of thing, a little bit lighter on the tannin. Okay. Cooler climate development yep. as opposed to a Northern California Pinot Noir okay. or a Burgundy where you're getting that deep, rich, earthy aroma yep. where we need something a little bit more closed in without this. This is the acid bump at the top, okay. as George Beadle would call it. And if you want to talk about glass development, George Riedel is the guru. Okay. Acid um, Bump actually is one of my favorite bands in the 70s. Nice. A lot of people don't, yeah, <laughs> nice. I didn't think it would come up in this podcast. Nice. Strange, what, strange so strange how, why would this... So why back, would back to performance. Yeah. <laughs> what we've done with performance is they have, as I turn this glass, I'm hoping you can see that, you can see that it's got a optical effect to it. And with this optical effect, we end up with the optical impact. That impact is that we have more surface area on the inside of the glass now, which is allowing more of the aroma to come forward okay. and more of the flavor to come through in the wine as a result. Does it not impact though when, because the, for one of the first things I'm doing with a, with a wine of that age is I'm looking at the brick and I'm trying to you know, to, uh, understand what it is at the rim, which is why I, I go crazy when you know, people serve out of wines that have anything but just pure perfect crystal mm -hmm. on the outside. So how does this impact that? It doesn't affect your view at all. You can still see through this the exact same way I could read through the glass. Okay. Uh, as soon as you turn it, you end up with that visible. We actually took the optical impact down significantly from where it was with the first test glasses. Okay. First of all, it was dizzying to look at. And second, it was an over, over decorative. It wasn't function right. anymore. It was almost to the decorative point. Okay. So we scaled it back to a point where it does its job without impeding the enjoyment of the glass and of the product that's in it. It's not taking away from your enjoyment. Cool. But this is the first range that George and Max designed together, as I said. And when they created this glassware, um, our, our Riesling glass now is completely different from anything else. The Pinot, you can see, has got a deeper base to it, a little bit uh, wider top end. Uh, subtle changes from the other things, but performance because it is high performance. We have taken this, which we thought was the piece de resistance and refined it. Very neat. Um, so I'm not going to keep you for long, but there's three things I really want to find out. First off, uh, again, I find the whole thing fascinating. If someone is in Austria, like going to a winery, uh, are they able to go to Riedel and learn about it? Absolutely. At, at the at the Riedel, so they... we have the, our corporate offices and our headquarters where we create our handmade glass is in Kufstein, Austria. Uh, Kufstein. It, is, it is open for tourism, open all the time. 
Um, and where is that in relation to, like, where would you land? Uh, land the easiest place to land is in Munich. You're approximately an hour and 15 minutes straight south of Munich on okay. the Autobahn. If you were going to Kitzbühel to ski, you're going to drive through Kufstein. Okay. If you're going from Munich to Innsbruck, you're going to drive through Kufstein. Okay. Um, it's just, it's kind of, it's literally right across the Inn River from Germany. Okay. Uh, beautiful community, and the signs to find the glassworks are easy to find. The other thing I wanted to find out, I mean, this is retail, and retail is incredible. Nobody is in retail in any way, shape, or form without being impacted by Amazon. So where are most people buying your product? How are your retailers affected by it? And do you move, because of the specificity of it, do you move most of your product through very hands-on retailers? Or are you finding that people are doing a lot of business through Amazon or doesn't it affect it at all? We do a lot of business through Amazon. We do a lot of business through specialty retail. We do a lot of business through mass market retailers as well. So if you're here in Canada, HBC oh, okay. carries our products and they're carrying the middle to upper tiers. If you go into Winners in Canada or Target in the U.S., you're getting our entry price point products. Okay. There are 11 steps on the Riedel ladder. So we have a uh, almost a 12-step program. Okay. <laughs> Which is kind of strange for the way it works, but no, I always, I I always think it's funny. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, leave it where are because every 12. time I do them, I leave it 11. So that's fine. Right. So <laughs> can't complete anything. <laughs> so we have, we have a glassware for all, as we like to say. We start out with our glasses in Canada at... Um, Fifteen dollars a stem, yeah, and we go all the way up to one hundred and fifty dollars a stem. You know what? And here's the thing. I mean, if you are drinking wines of this caliber or other calibers, I mean, this is not necessarily your everyday glass. But if it's special enough that you're opening up a wine of that type, it deserves uh, the proper vessel, right, to Absolutely. be enjoyed. And in. I don't, you know, the the idea. Geez, I was, I, yeah, I've, I've almost gotten to traveling with stemware almost because I, I will travel with wine. But then I show up somewhere and I wind up with these big, heavy, big lip uh, uh, glasses, and I just I'm going to get you one of my wine travel bags. Oh, wine travel! Well, it I've holds, got I've actually got a Vingard release that I use to carry, uh, uh, and I've got a glass insert for it, so I can. But that means I'm taking space of two bottles. But now I yeah. or, or but I, I think I'm willing to, to to give that up now. So as we uh, as we complete, I'm wondering um, uh, what your favorite decanter is. My favorite decanter, again, kind of like picking a favorite child, we have over 60 decanters in the collection. Really? And all the decanters do the exact same thing. They're going to do the three things that it does for wine. One of my favorites is the swan that's here. I would think. I'm I was wondering if that fairly, was going to be. fairly lazy as it can be. And I can actually reach from here and pour four people oh, all okay. the way around my table okay. with this decanter without having to, to move around. I love the Eve which you use uh, on the back here beside us as well because of the intricacy of using it. Yeah, the um, ceremony of it. It's, it's different decanters for different situations as yeah. far as I'm concerned. There's no varietal specific decanter. You can put any wine you want into it. Do people decant champagne? Yes. Okay. Um, Maximilian does. It's one of those things that draws some strange looks from some folks. Sure. But as you decant the champagne, you're actually mitigating some of the bubble yes. and some of the acidity on the front end, and you're really beginning to smell the base wine that it's made okay. from. Okay. So lastly, um, if people want to do one of these great uh, uh, varietal specific tastings that I did and learn more about your product, where would they go to do that? Now, there's two ways to do it. You can go straight to Riedel.com and to our tasting calendar and you can find a tasting near you. Okay. But if you're looking to host one yourself and you want to do an event for 40 people, uh, reach out to us through Riedel.com as well and we'll be happy to work with you to put one together great. in your area. You know, I could honestly, we try to keep these at 15 minutes, but you and I mm -hmm. could sit here and talk for hours. I love your product. Uh, I find, I've, I've found the whole thing since we did that first tasting really, really fascinating. And the more that I've had great wines inside of, inside of great uh, vessels produced by Riedel, uh, the more it's, it's really added to my enjoyment of wine over Sorry, the years. Cool. So thank cheers you. to that. Uh, you guys have a tremendous product. Uh, and thank you for coming and, and sharing this bottle of uh, 171170 Codestrinelle uh, in the great uh, Elton John I Am Decanter. So uh, on behalf of Behind Fine Wine, uh, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to uh, our next uh, edition. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.